Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Prospect Blueprint. I'm Kelly Kleinman. Today, we have with us a gentleman who has been in the thick of high school and college sports for over four decades. He's a career educator and certified master athletic administrator with 40 years of success as a teacher, a head coach, and as an AD. He recently retired as the director of athletic enrichment at the McClay School, an independent college prep school in beautiful Tallahassee, Florida. He also served as the 2021 president of the Florida Interscholastic Athletic Administrators Association. Try saying that five times. It's a tongue twister. In June of 2020, he created the Educational AD Podcast, which showcases high school ADs from around the country. He also directs Victory Educational Athletics, a consulting firm for schools offering professional development in coaches' education, athletic leadership, and parent engagement. He also has a new book. He's a busy guy. The Athletic Director's Toolbox. You have to have one if you're an AD. The Top 20 Tools for Success from our first 150 interviews. It's available on Amazon, and we'll run that up here on the screen shortly. My guest, after all of that, is Mr. Jake Von Scherer, C-M-A-A. Welcome aboard, Jake. Kelly, thanks so much for um, asking me to be on board. Very excited to uh, talk with you and, and maybe share a little bit with your listeners. Well, you're definitely the guy. You've been through it, and uh, really, I, I couldn't think of a more expert individual to have on the show. But let's get right into it, because you offer a very unique perspective on high school sports and what it takes to be successful, a recruitable amateur athlete, I should say, not only from a coaching perspective, but, but obviously from an AD's perspective as well. But first, what inspired you to be an athletic administrator, coach, and mentor? Well, um, it, it, it's odd that you should say that. It's, it seems like I've been having that same conversation with a number of people the last couple of weeks. And as you mentioned, I retired uh, this past year after 41 years. And when I started out, uh, I, I knew coming out of college, uh, I like to say that injuries and a lack of talent kept me out of the NFL. Um, but I knew I wanted to be a coach and uh, I was okay with being a teacher because back then that's how you did it. And um, long story short, started, you know, working as a teacher and coach, middle school, high school, climbing that ladder and really didn't think much about becoming an athletic director. I was very fortunate to have some great mentors, some head coaches I worked under and some athletic directors that I worked with as models that served me very well later on. But my first job as an AD was right before school started one year. Uh, the principal came to me and said, hey, um, you know, Johnny just quit. You know, you're the athletic director. And so it was a trial by fire. And again, there, there was a lot of help. Uh, so it, it struck me. And for a few years, I continuing in both roles as a head football coach and as the athletic director uh, before being approached by another school to just become their AD. And um, that's where I think I really begin to truly become a, a professional athletic director. I got involved with our state association, got involved with the, the national association, the NIAAA, and it just really grew from there. So it, it wasn't some grand plan, but it allowed me to continue to stay involved in athletics, uh, to have an impact uh, on kids, not directly as a coach, but by helping coach their coaches so that they could, you know, do the best job that they could. So it's just, it's just been great. Uh, I like to say it, it beats working for a living. Uh, I haven't had to work in 40 years uh, and then I got to retire. So that's pretty cool. You fell into it. Fate often cushions our falls. So here's a question for you, because you were uh, a football coach as well and an AD. And well, as an athlete that's focused primarily on one sport, should I consider being a multi-sport athlete and why? Well, it, it's certainly a hot uh, topic uh, these days. And, you know, people generally uh, are going to fall into, you know, the extremes of that continuum. A um, hundred years ago, uh, back in the 70s, when I was in high school and in college, um, that's what you did. You know, you were you did two and three sports. There were no year round athletes. Um, now you, you see it quite frequently. 
uh, trying to speak objectively. And um, you know, a, as an AD, as a coach, and as a parent, uh, we had three kids. Uh, my wife was a career coach. Uh, our three kids, we didn't force them, um, but they all did three sports through high school. All three uh, played collegiately. Uh, so it, it really didn't hurt them. Uh, the research is very clear on this. It's an emotional issue, but if you look at the research, the research is very clear that participating in multiple sports, particularly at the middle school and even at the high school level, uh, is the way to go for, uh, let's say, having fun and also for greater success. Uh, you talk to virtually any college coach with a possible exception of college volleyball, and they're going to tell you, we want kids that are doing multiple sports, boys and girls. Number one, it reduces the likelihood of the overuse injury that you see in any sport, you know, baseball, volleyball, basketball, whatever. Um, how many year round football players do you know about? You know, they're out, they're running track, they're wrestling, they're playing basketball. Um, it also makes you a better athlete through those cross training drills that you're going to get uh, doing other sports. And I think most important, it continues to teach you how to compete. You know, it's great to go in the weight room and lift. It's great to go to the, your club and work on drills and skills and, and all of that stuff. But going out there, what, you know, take your pick. It's a soccer, it's wrestling, it's basketball, it's baseball, playing that other sport. You've got coaches and teammates that are pushing you and challenging you and holding you accountable to be the best that you can be. It teaches you and reinforces how to compete. And you just don't get that in the weight room or in the skill session. Um, you know, parents will say that, uh, well, it's the only way my kid can make it to college. Well, maybe your kid's not going to college anyway. Okay? Uh, and I would bet them a milkshake that if they let that kid, you know, you know, let's say he's a basketball player. Oh, uh, he's going to get hurt playing football. He's, I had my nose broken three times playing basketball. And uh, it's, if you're going to get hurt, you're going to get hurt. So uh, uh, let that kid do multiple sports is, is my professional as well as my personal opinion. Let the kid have fun. Now, if the kid is telling you, if your son or your daughter is coming to you and just saying, oh, I love Take your pick. Volleyball. I love cross country. I love wrestling, whatever. If they just love it and it's the kid driving that bus, hey, you know, that's okay. But I have maybe seen in my 40 plus years, I've maybe seen that uh, I'll go high twice, okay, where the kid is driving that. Almost all the time, it's the parent. So uh, again, you asked the question, I gave you my answer. The research supports it. Do multiple sports. Uh, your heart and your head should support that too. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think there's probably some high school coaches who might not admit that they would prefer one sport, guys, to focus on their sport. But I, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, here's the next hot take, I think, and, and sort of a kind of a big topic right now. What's your take on kids transferring from high school to high school? And do you think that it's a trend or common practice now? And in what circumstances does it make sense? In my area, I know one young man, he's an amazing kid, but he literally transferred four or five times. He was in four or five different schools in the same conference. Right. Uh, well, there's a case here in Florida, a guy, um, let's say 10 years ago, uh, where a young man uh, was at four different schools uh, for basketball, uh, a different school each year, four schools in four years, played division one and ended up, you know, having a, a cup of coffee or so in the, in the NBA. Uh, but if you're asking me, do I like it? Absolutely not. Uh, I, I guess I'm that cranky old guy sitting on his front porch. Um, it used to be kids wanted to play for their high school team. Boy, I can't wait to wear that uniform. And now it's, you know, hey, uh, I need my reps. You know, I, I, need, I need my cuts. I need the ball. Uh, what about me? Uh, and it, it just runs so um, contrary to how I was raised, how I was coached, 
And I, I just don't buy that it's a different time. Okay. Well, it's, it's about, we want our kids to have fun. We want our high school kids and our college kids, you know, to enjoy the experience. Uh, but whatever happened to, uh, you know, sucking it up and, um, and working harder, you know, Hey, I'm not going to start as a freshman who does. Okay. I mean, that, that's still rare. And if you do, that's great. And if you don't, well, Hey, maybe you need to work a little bit harder instead of looking for an easier way out. Um, I'm not saying it, it's right, wrong, good, or bad, but my opinion is I, I just don't like it. Um, uh, the colleges loosen the transfer rules and, and maybe there is a time to transfer. You just, you're button heads with a coach or the coach is a jerk. I mean, uh, I mean, it happens, yeah. but uh, uh, I, I really don't like to see it, particularly at the high school level, um, but it, it's here. And I think you just, you make the most of it. Um, Would you consider, well, here's a thought. I'm the parent of a middle school child, athlete, he or she. Would you consider or would you consider it a smart strategy to go out and actually scout high schools, sort of see who else they have in the pipeline, see what's going on, um, you know, from a, a talent level, just to sort of be able to project what your, your possibilities might be at that particular school? Because here in, 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 Thousand, in the Thousand Oaks area, we could go to a number of different schools and they're all pretty competitive. Uh, and so I would think that it might behoove somebody to go and see, see what, who's out there. If there's this one superstar kid who committed to a, a college playing at the position your kid wants when he's a year older, maybe you, you know, maybe you don't go to that high school. What, how do you get around it? Because kids do want their reps. They do want to have their opportunities. And sometimes high school coaches just don't provide that. It's just the way the coach is. Right. Well, um, to your question, you know, should you go out and, and scout, you know, the schools? Uh, I, I think you should. I think you should scout, you know, what they offer athletically, but maybe before that, scout their academics. You know, uh, wh what's their um, uh, college placement uh, percentages? Uh, what's the student teacher ratio? What are the co curricular activities that your son or daughter might be interested in? You know, music, drama, whatever. Uh, yes, of course, you know, interview those coaches or, you know, talk to them, look at the program. Um, and it, it's, really no different than choosing a college. You know, do you want an urban school? Do you want a rural school? Do you want a big school, small school? Do you want a school that's won championships uh, for the last 20 years? Or do you want a brand new school that's up and coming where you can be part of their history and help write that story? Uh, find that fit, you know, for you, uh, for the student, as well as for the family. Uh, but then when you make that decision, hey, let's stick it out. Okay, you know, yeah. let let's let's dig in, let's battle, let's be the best we can be. Uh, you know, the old expression, the helicopter parent, you know, that's got removed by the lawnmower parent. You know, trying to you know shave down and and uh, make challenges not quite as hard. Well, that's gone the way of the bulldozer parent that completely wants to remove any challenge or any hint of possible failure not understanding that that's how we grow, you know, by getting knocked down and getting back up again. So yes, scout that school, but make sure you're scouting everything, not just athletics. So from that standpoint, as far as coaching is concerned and scouting the coach is recruitment. And that would be college recruitment assistance in a standard coaching contract. And how do you approach that from an AD perspective or from a coaching standpoint? Yeah. How do you approach a college contract? Yeah, because a lot of, like, for example, we have a, a fellow out here, Jack Wilson, who um, was the coach at Thousand Oaks High School. He played pro ball. He was very good at getting colleges to come out and watch his players. He was a terrific recruiter. He's gotten several kids D1 deals. Of course, he got his son a D1 deal as well, but nonetheless, a very good coach. Um, is that, What is that conversation like between an AD and a high school coach? Hey, you know, um, how are you going? Do you, do you interview them and ask them how do you approach um, attracting colleges to your athletes? Because that I would suspect is certainly part of the equation. Sure. No, I mean we we talk about it, but again, every school is going to be different. Um, you know, I was at a private school, um, a couple of pretty good ones here in Florida for the last twenty years, and we have um, a very robust college 
uh, placement um, department, um, you know, five and six people full time. They're working on getting our kids into college, not from a sports perspective per se, although they're very good at that. But we're talking getting kids into Ivy League schools, service academies, et cetera. For the, uh, a public school, their college counseling department's probably not going to be that robust. And so a lot of times it will fall back onto the coach's shoulders to help uh, make those, uh, uh, the awareness of those opportunities uh, available to the kids. But let's also keep in mind, um, what's the percentage? 3% of uh, high school kids are going to play college sports. Um, you know, the, as you go down the, your roster, your baseball, volleyball, football roster, are you in that top 3%? Um, and it, it, if you're not, doesn't mean that you can't go, you know, there's probably a, a D2 or D3 or other school out there for you. So mm-hmm. as an AD, and I know a lot of really good public school ADs that have the same philosophy, uh, we were very upfront with our parents. Um, they're, and again, our school is a little bit different. They were at our school because they wanted their kid to go to college. If they could play sports, all the better. But from an athletic department, we would tell them our goal is not to get your kid a college scholarship. Okay. That's not our goal. Okay. Our goal is to provide your kid with a great high school experience in this case, you know, through sports. And that's, you know, practice, that's training, that's traveling on the bus to the games, and that's the game experience, whatever it turns out to be uh, for your son or your daughter. Uh, our goal is, is not, uh, you know, how many kids do we send to Division I uh, sports teams? And, and we would send kids to uh, teams, and that was great. But the, it, it was a byproduct of doing all the other things right, of, you know, having standards, uh, making the kids uh, adhere to those standards and challenge them to be the very best they could be in the uh, classroom as well as on the field. Uh, a big public high school, they might have a different philosophy, and that's fine. It, it, like I said, it's not right, wrong, good, or bad. It's just, you know, what's your philosophy and go with it. Um, the, if, if a coach is not, if a coach has a kid that wants to go to college and has communicated that to him, coach, I really want to play college ball, whatever that is. Now I think it's behooves the coach to do what he can to help make that happen. Um, you know, I made tons of phone calls for kids as a coach, as an, as an AD. Um, you know, we, we used to, you know, you'll probably remember this. We used to send out, you know, VHS tapes. Okay. And then it was DVDs and now it's all online, which is great, but it's, it's a part of that process, but it certainly doesn't, and I don't think should drive the bus just because most of your kids are never going to play college sports. Okay. Yeah, quite true. And I don't want to downplay the importance of academics. The first thing any college recruiter is going to ask you is what's your GPA? That's exactly right (laughs) off the bat. Well, you mentioned parents and, uh, and I am one. And at one point, I was a disgruntled uh, parent with a, a head coach who had a little bit of a drinking issue. But aside from that, every AD and head coach has had to deal with a disgruntled parent. How do you handle parent-coach issues? And I know you've had a few good ones, and I asked you to, to create, uh, go back and give me a few anecdotes. So let's hear what you got. <laughs> well, I, again, I think... Uh, you, you just need to understand in, in this day and age, and this didn't happen yesterday, it's been around for a while, is yeah. that parents, um, they want to be more involved, and they're going to be more involved. You know, I, I look back to my high school days, my mom and dad, they knew my coaches, and my coaches knew them, not that they were important people, but if they passed each other in the grocery store aisle, you know, they could say hi to each other by name. But other than that, I don't think my mom and dad ever had a conversation with any of my high school coaches uh, about playing time or, or about anything ever. Okay. And, and that was the norm. Um, and that just doesn't happen now. So I think as an athletic director and as a head coach, you just need to understand, you know, parents are going to be involved. Now you can make that an, um, an adversarial relationship you know, hey, I don't talk to parents, you know, you know, we don't talk about playing time or um, you can work toward uh, what our national organization, the NIAAA is calling partnering with parents. Um, 
very quickly. You know, we would do our parent meetings at the start of the year, start of the season, and we would tell our parents word for word, you know, you are a very important part of this team. You know, we want you involved, uh, but these are the things we need to, you to do. And the number one thing was cheer like crazy for your kid, you know, be a fan. And we talked in sub bullet points, you know, help build the program, be a positive example, cheer for other kids. Don't just cheer for your own kids, cheer for other kids. Uh, the, the cliche, and it's a cliche, but it's so important. On the drive home, don't discuss the game. Just say, hey, I really love watching you play and let the kid lead that discussion. If the kid wants to stew, let him stew. Okay, It's their stinking game. But we were very clear, very proactive in kind of a, uh, an in-your-face but a positive way with our parents about, hey, you're involved, and you know this is where that involvement ends. And for the vast majority of our parents, that works. Um, for the ones that are still going to call you, they're still going to email you, they're still going to come in your office, come on in, let's talk. And I would tell them that my door is always open. And my door was always open unless I was talking to a parent or a kid. Um, and the parent would come in and you know they would have a concern. And regardless of how they couched it, uh, you know, can, I, can I come in and see you? Absolutely, come on in. Um, regardless of how they couched it, 99% of the time, what did it end up being about? It was about playing time. And again, you need to understand that as a coach, as an AD. As a head coach, what's your job? Put the best team out there. As a parent, what's their job? Be the number one supporter of their kid. And so they're looking at it from their kid's perspective, not from your perspective as a team. You got to understand that. Um, the parents would come in. Um, I remember one in particular, a baseball mom and dad, uh, and it was about playing time, even though they said it wasn't, they had the largest collection of baseball data from that season uh, to support their cause. And I'm not a baseball guy. Yeah. And I just go, oh, boy, that's very interesting. Uh, the, the, the dad kept talking about, well, he has the most quality at bats of anybody on the team. And I'm what the heck is a quality at bat? Uh, I, I can see his batting average at 0.96. Okay, uh, I'm looking at the stat sheet on Max Preps. Uh, he, he's got like 16 errors. Um, I, and so I'm just letting him share all this stuff with me. And I said, well, I appreciate you coming in, um, you know, positioning and, you know, starting positions and playing time. That's a coach's decision. Talking about a varsity team. Uh, let's just, is your son having a good time? Oh, he's having a great time. I said, well, let's just let him uh, keep working, keep hustling. And ironically, uh, about two weeks later, you know, he had batted his way out of his slump and he's now starting. But, uh, you know, the parents were convinced that the head coach had it out for their kid and that, you know, I was not being supportive of them. But I just said, hey, thanks for coming in. We appreciate it. Uh, I did follow up with my coach to ask what the heck a quality at bat was. Um, and, you know, we move on. And at some point, the, the five years I was at McClay, I had to ask this, or I had to make this statement two times. Um, I said, at the end of it, uh, where they just really, you know, they, they weren't saying, well, thank you. I said, well, maybe this isn't the right school for your child. Uh, oh, no, we love it here. I said, well, then why are we having this talk? So yeah. it is tough. And, you know, parents do feel, I, I, like I said, I had three kids and I felt for them when they were, uh, you know, not starting or, or whatever. It didn't happen that often, but <laughs> uh, you feel for your kids. I get it. And I would tell parents that I've sat in that chair. I know exactly what you feel. So you, you just have to understand it's part of the job. But I think the single most important thing is what I talked about earlier is you communicate, hey, this is how we roll. This is who we are. And, you know, we want you involved. You've got some very important um, uh, jobs to help us uh, have a successful program, to help make sure your kid has a fun time. But this is how we roll. Yeah, makes sense. Well, we spoke about coaches. What do you look for when you hire one? What are some of the qualities that you look for in a good head coach, any sport? Well, I, I think for me, the I, I want to see, I want to hear when you're having that interview, uh, that they are really excited about their sport and excited about teaching it 
two kids, whether it's, you know, the, the third middle school team, you know, the kids that literally can't walk and chew gum or your varsity team or beyond, you know, you, you want to hear, you want to see, you want to feel that passion. Um, I let them know um, right off the bat and whether they're a varsity coach or that third middle school coach, I, I tell them, you know, you could win every single game and I fire you the next day. Or you could lose every single game and we're celebrating like, you know, we just won the Super Bowl uh, because the kids are saying, boy, what a great experience. Boy, I wish we had five more games to play. Boy, I can't wait till next year. And for middle school or varsity, that's what I want to hear. Now, we also want to see on that day to day basis. You know, we want to see instruction. We want to see encouragement. We want to see motivation. We want to see teaching strategies at an appropriate level. And at the varsity level, yeah, well, even at the middle school level, we do want to win. But as I mentioned earlier, the winning we feel is a byproduct of doing all the other things right, like coming to practice every day, working hard, supporting your teammates, being a good uh, uh, member of the school. Um, you know, that if, if there's talent there, you know, we've got an idea how much talent is there. We want the coach to make it a little bit better, uh, on those years where that cycle is down and, you know, there's not as much talent as you might like, sure. we still want those coaches to be coaching those kids hard, uh, encouraging them and doing the best they can. And, and as an AD, we have to do our jobs of proper scheduling, um, you know, making sure we're not scheduling six um, defending uh, playoff teams for that team, for our team that might be on a down cycle. You know, let's maybe, you know, schedule a couple below classification and try to get a couple of those wins. And again, our schools, we were very fortunate. We won a lot. You know, we hung a lot of state banners, which is great, but we also had full rosters. Uh, our kids wanted to play. They wanted to be there. Um, and I, I, our coaches did a great job of, uh, not just having winning teams, but, you know, teaching kids. And again, it's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. Those lifelong values of dedication, commitment, sacrifice, teamwork. They wanted to wear our school jerseys. You know, they wanted to represent our school. That's what we want to see in, in our kids. And that comes from our coaches. Once in a while, you see some of those NFL players and they they're in the lineup and they talk about the college they went to so-and-so Ohio state university. So-and-so orange high school, Cleveland, Ohio, you know, it's right. kind of an interesting yeah. thing. You want to take pride in that. It makes sense. So you're engaged with eighties from all over the country. What issues or challenges aside from COVID do they see on a daily basis and, and possibly into the future? Well, guys, I, I think probably the, uh, the two biggest ones that, that I hear about, and I know that they are very true, um, obviously, you know, budgeting disparities uh, from one school to the next, you know, funding programs. Um, and I'm, we're not just talking about, say, coaching stipends, which is a completely different uh, conversation, but, you know, transportation, getting kids to and from games, um, you know, the officials shortage and, and having to pay, um, you know, for additional uh, officials that might not be certified. You know, the budgeting issues are certainly a challenge for everybody these days. Um, the other challenge it would be the actual workload. I was very fortunate um, at my, let's say, the last uh, 20 years uh, I was an AD, where I was almost exclusively an athletic director. You know, for a while I was a head football coach, but Many ADs now, uh, they're uh, head coach in one sport, maybe they're an assistant in a second sport, uh, and they're teaching multiple sections of whatever course they're certified in. It might be strength and conditioning, but that's still time that you are not able to devote to scheduling and supervising and making sure that all those athletic events run smoothly. You know, I talked to ADs um, every month, I was going to say every week, and it might be that close, but I talk to ADs every month that they're teaching, let's say, five out of six periods a day, coaching a sport. And oh, by the way, you're also the athletic director for all of the sports at your school. And it's just um, such a soul crushing experience for people in that position. There's no wonder we have such a turnover 
uh, in, in our profession. And so what we, we try to do uh, with NIAAA, as well as at the state level, is we just try to provide everyone, but especially those types of ADs, with professional development, with assistance, uh, with a mentor AD in their area, if if that's required, and just try to help them meet the demands that are, it's a great job, but like any job, if you don't have the time to do it well, it, it can begin to weigh on you. Yeah, I can imagine. Let's go into one more subject, um, which is sort of becoming a little bit more prevalent also, and that's the gap year. Now, many athletes develop later than others. Um, here in my neighborhood, again, uh, extremely athletically um, oriented and a really big push to get kids college deals. It's, you know, there's some communities that are just that way. Um, here in my neighborhood, folks are turning to prep schools uh, during a gap year uh, so they could develop a little bit more, get reps. Is this a viable option or is there any kind of downside or risky choice to it at all, in your opinion? Well, again, it, we, we've got some um, uh, schools here in Florida that provide that gap year. Uh, they're not, you know, obviously they're not part of the state association, but uh, they do exist. And, and I, obviously they're filling a need for an individual that uh, wants to play at that next level. And maybe their gap is academic or maybe their gap is athletic, or maybe it's both. Uh, I see nothing wrong with it, but obviously these things cost some money. And so if you, if a parent is considering this for their son or daughter, I, I think you do your due diligence. And just like we talked about checking out, you know, middle school programs and high school programs, you know, check them out. Um, you know, what's their success rate for placing the students that enroll there? Uh, what's their, um, you know, what's the lifestyle going to be like? Um, you know, how much focus on academics, how much focus on athletics, um, you know, is it uh, an old school uh, Vince Lombardi or Jake Von Sheer, you know, type of football coach? Or uh, are they open to, you know, the latest techniques and physical and uh, social emotional learning? Um, if, if it works for them, I I've got no problem with it. Tell us about your new book and where can we get it? Well, the book is called The Athletic Director's Toolbox, and it came out of uh, our podcast, the Educational AD Podcast. Uh, one of our segments is called um, the AD's Toolbox. And we ask all of our guests, what three things would you put in a new athletic director's toolbox? Most of our guests are fairly experienced and in many cases, uh, award-winning and Hall of Fame athletic directors. Mm -hmm. So in the first 150 interviews that we did, we had a total of 473 tools. Now, many of that 473 were repeated, but uh, what I did was I took all of them and I was able to arrange them into 20 different categories of tools. So that's where the top 20 tools for success came about. So these are suggestions from athletic directors across the country, even a couple of international ADs, uh, but definitely some of the truly best in our business. Um, it's been out for a couple of months now. It's available on Amazon. Uh, it's only $9.99. And um, we're continuing to do our interviews. Like I said, uh, the first 150 went into the book. We're currently on number, uh, I, I think we just posted number 218. So there's another 68. When we get to our second collection of 150, that's going to go into the second edition of the AD's toolbox. And I'm thinking that might come out probably summer of 2022, but it was completely unexpected. Uh, one of our guests said, Jake, you know, this would make a great book. And I go, seriously, you think so? Uh, and, you know, people, like I told you, people are listening to the podcast. So we're going to keep doing the interviews. Uh, people are, you know, buying the book. So, uh, you know, we'll keep it going. I have one other question. We're going to go off script with this because you've impressed me. And I have a friend of mine who's uh, an AD, and he finds it a very rewarding career. If I was a student, what curriculum, what journey would you suggest I take from an academic standpoint to get to that position? Well, gosh, that's a very good question. I know nowadays uh, many colleges and universities are offering 
that is an undergraduate degree, athletic administration. You know, back in my day, it was, you know, the, the PE major, you know, the PE health major. Um, and maybe you were even a history or a math major, but you wanted to coach. And that's what you, you taught history for nine or 10 years and you coached basketball or whatever. And then you kind of drifted into that AD position. Now you can get an undergraduate degree in athletic administration. So uh, I think if, if you really feel that being an athletic director is in your blood uh, and that's what you want to do, look for colleges and universities that offer that as an undergraduate major, or at least um, as a graduate degree. And, and there's several out there. So um, along with that, there, nothing beats uh, the theory is good, but nothing beats the practical experience. Um, if you're not already doing this, get involved at a local school, um, you know, as a coach, as an official, as uh, a non-paid <laughs> intern, you, you go and introduce yourself to the athletic director and say, hey, I would like to be an AD down the road. Uh, can I shadow you? Can I help you? Um, if, if they come up with some bucks for you, maybe some gas money, even better. But those experiences on how to set up the gym for volleyball, um, how to break down the gym after a game, uh, dealing with officials, uh, you know, the hiring process and confirming and transportation. Uh, I, I can't tell you, I had those experiences, some on purpose, some by accident as an undergrad, um, and definitely during my early career uh, as a teacher and a coach. Um, and it is so, so valuable to what you're going to be doing when they finally give you the keys to the gym and say, okay, you know, you're the athletic director and re reach out. Uh, you know, I'm very um, uh, visible on, uh, on Twitter and on Facebook and the NIAAA platform. Um, reach out and, and email coaches and ADs and introduce yourself. You know, um, if you reach out to a football coach or a baseball coach or a basketball coach and say, hey, you know, I, I'd like to learn from you, coaches are much more guarded. Um, athletic directors, we can't wait to share um, different ideas. So, you know, email and call those ADs. I guarantee it'll be the start of a great relationship and somebody that's going to be helping you out, uh, continuing to help you out down the road of your career. Last question, where can we find your podcast? We are on, uh, I think, all of the major podcast carriers, and it's called The Educational AD Podcast. We post new content, new interviews uh, every Monday and Friday. And then we have some uh, real quick segments. Uh, the Mentoring Minute is uh, brand new every Tuesday. Uh, one of our great ADs here in Florida, Dan Como, is our mentoring guru. And then on Thursdays, we have team building tips with another one of our great Florida ADs. Mentoring Minute's about five minutes long. Uh, team building tips are about maybe 15, 16 minutes long. And then we have special features that we air on Wednesdays. But uh, uh, we're out there, and uh, we'd love to have you listen. Folks, give them a listen. Well, Coach Von Scherer, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Kelly, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. And have a happy holiday. All, all the best to you, too. Folks, that was it. This is the Prospect Blueprint. I'm Kelly Kleiman. Have a great day. Thank you.